Welcome to Marin Voices and Views. With Lawrence A. Strick, I'm Peter B. Collins. Welcome. In our second segment today, we'll be joined by political writer Richard Rappaport, who is covering this exciting race for the open congressional seat in Marin County and up the North Coast. And our first guest today is a candidate for that post. Marin Supervisor Susan Adams was elected to her third term last year, and she presently serves as president of the board. Before public service, she was a nurse and was a professor of nursing at Dominican University. She recently announced that she's running for the open congressional seat, which represents Marin and the coastal communities all the way up to the Oregon border. Viewers should know that I served as a paid advisor on the Adams campaign in 2002 and in 2010, and that I'm not presently working for any of the candidates for Congress. Susan Adams, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You've been a successful office holder here at the local level. What is your case for asking voters to send you to Congress? I think the local level has been an absolutely wonderful training camp um, for how to deal with our issues on the broader scale. Um, at the local level, we're not partisan, and we have to solve problems from our community. And I've had the experience of bringing some very controversial issues over the finish line. Uh, for example, finding closure on our San Rafael rock quarry issue, where all parties agreed that the conditions were fair and asked our board to support the 175 conditions in the permit. Um, I was the swing vote on our Marine Clean Energy Authority. And uh, that has been doing amazingly well. And we're looking um, to other energy programs up and down the coast uh, in order to help stimulate jobs and to carry the green energy program forward. We have a, a criminal justice system that now has therapeutic approaches to justice where we've uh, reduced the recidivism in mentally ill offenders by 85% and psych emergency visits by 55%. And all of these, plus my work with counties across the country on the national level, has helped us to create a platform and to get the ear of Washington, D.C., that when we're actually looking at how to solve the problems, it really does have to happen at the local level. And so if we have the infrastructure in place and we have the relationships in place and we can figure out the funding, and especially in this time of um, economic challenges still, um, where people are losing their homes, losing their jobs, losing their health care, um, I think that that local focus is resonating really well with the people up and down the coast. It sounds like you've, well, you've done great things. And I want to, as, as someone who you're working for, I'd like to thank you. But you've, you've had a lot of accomplishments on the local level uh, about uh, the, going to Washington, essentially being a backbencher, sitting way back there, uh, is attractive to you. And, and what, 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 would make me say, hey, yeah, Susan would be great to have sitting back there. Well, anybody who knows me knows I'm not a backbencher. I'm going to hit the <laughs> ground running. I already have relationships with a number of the regulatory agencies, FTA, even in the Pentagon when we're working on Army Corps issues and flood zone projects, Health and Human Services. I'm no stranger to Washington, D.C. And the platform that we helped to create, uh, I was the co-chair for um, the uh, Health Steering Committee for the National Association of Counties. We created a platform that actually got the attention of the Obama administration. And we were able to be part of the conversation at the table with the administration on how to deliver uh, the goods. Also, people that know me know that I'm not afraid to go up against the corporate giants. And I've been successful more than not. Um, I've had great people supporting me from the community, and I think the experience that I, I bring um, has been a really great uh, training camp for me to know how the political system works, to be able to have successes at the local level, and to use those successes as templates for others to show this is how we can do it, and this is how we can do it and create jobs and create a vibrant economy and address climate change. and address a system of health care uh, that can serve everybody. And it's already resonating at the local level. And I think what's going to happen is the work that local governments have been doing across the country um, are going to be the examples for the states and the national government to take a look, and especially as we're trying to deal with some really important national issues. 
So you've already started campaigning in Marin and up the coast. Uh, what kind of reaction are you getting? This is a pretty big field of candidates. I, I'm getting really great reaction. Actually, I have pretty deep roots in Northern California. I'm a fifth generation from San Francisco, fourth generation Mendocino ranching family. I have family in Humboldt County. And I think the people, especially in the North Coast counties, are very concerned about having an elected representative that doesn't have roots, deep roots in, in those counties. Um, I've had a great deal of support uh, helping me launch uh, from Emily's List, which is really interested in trying to keep a woman elected in the seat because we have less than 17% of our elected body women in Congress right now. Uh, Lynn Woolsey represented us well and they've really targeted this, um, this seat. Uh, I have support from American uh, Nurses Association California Division. I think healthcare professionals are going to be very interested in me with my knowledge, education, and background in the healthcare arena. And um, people that know my my brother and his family, or know my ranching family in Mendocino, you know, are comforted by the fact that somebody. Uh, it is related to people that they know well in those communities, and it's really helped me branch out. Um, the National Women's Political Caucus um, community uh, members in, in some of those areas that I've been visiting um, are very interested in, in helping a woman be successful. And each of the candidates um, that are especially running on a democratic perspective are going to have very similar general messages about get out of the war, take care of our local economy, um, deal with our health care system in a way that provides access for everyone. Um, I think those values are going to be resonating across uh, the, the different candidates. And the question will be, what is the lens uh, that each of us takes when we're looking at how to solve problems? And each of us comes with a different lens and a different perspective. Now, Congresswoman Woolsey um, carved out a really liberal record. She was co-chair of the Progressive Caucus, outspoken about the, both wars. Uh, where do you come in on, on the continuum of progressive versus sort of corporate Democrat and uh, what part of her legacy would you look to continue forward with in Congress? Well, I'm, a, I'm an unapologetic liberal, especially on a woman's right to choose, on clean water, on clean air. And I don't know how you can live in this country and not want clean air to breathe or clean water to drink. Yet there are some really heated battles going on right now about what exactly defines clean water. Uh, some groups trying to keep it maintained in the new legislation to only that water uh, that is navigable for shipping industry. And y yes, <laughs> it's, you, you look perplexed. Flexed. But I'm hearing That's I'm hearing strange. this at the at the at the national levels with counties, and there are a, there's a large group of people say we don't want you mucking around in our streams on our private property with our drainage ditches, and yet everything that drains down into the river is going to be picking up um, whatever is in those streams all the way down to those navigable waters. So we have some really challenging issues, and I'm unapologetic about my stance on those. The, but I'm also, I think, uh, fiscally um, conservative. How do we get a grip on our um, costs? How do we get a grip in doing things smarter? How do we uh, generate jobs that are, are going to be good paying jobs, stimulate the economy, help small businesses not be so overburdened by some of the regulatory issues that are going on in terms of tax law and everything else? If we really are interested in stimulating the economy with our small businesses, we have to take a look at that. But the other misnomer nationally that's going on is that somehow public jobs are not good jobs too. And those people pay taxes. And those people are part of our system that's helping us build and maintain our infrastructure, our librarians, the people that answer 911 calls when we're having chest pain, the people that are putting out our fires. And so we have to be able to start changing the dialogue about what is a good job. And all those jobs just don't come from corporate America. I wish more would come from corporate America. Um, but Jerry Brown recently addressed our California State Association of Counties and said the large corporations in our state have been generating billions of dollars in revenue, even during this recession and more than what they were doing even before the recession and we're not seeing it translated into job development or job growth and that's that's a problem 
Supervisor, many Democrats now feel that President Obama has shown weak leadership, especially on the extension of the Bush tax cuts last year and this summer on the debt ceiling debate. Uh, tell me how you feel about his leadership and with your history of being pretty tight-fisted with taxpayer dollars, uh, how do you view the Tea Party-driven debate over the debt? Well, first, you know, I, I just have to say that what the president is in the middle of is not an easy job. And he inherited a legacy from the previous administration that he's trying to find his way out of now. Um, the, uh, uh, President Obama didn't cause what we're experiencing now on Wall Street. The, the, the tax cuts and the deregulations that happened under the Bush administration, at the same time launching a very expensive war in the Middle East, um, was uh, what the legacy is that he's trying to deal with. Now, he's a great orator and he inspires hope and change in the people that hear him. But I think that when you're trying to compromise with people that aren't wanting to compromise, that's a problem. And so if, if you're saying, um, you know, we'll, 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 let's look at this issue in terms of, you know, how do we restructure Medicare or Social Security, which, by the way, I think we've made a promise to our seniors that we can't break now. Um, but as that is an example, you know, and you have a group saying, no way over our dead bodies, we've made a pledge that we're never going to raise another tax um, in the United States, and yet we have bridges that are falling down in Minnesota, and we have our own infrastructure here in this county, and I know up and down the counties, $250 million worth of untended infrastructure that needs to be repaired here. How do we value as an American people the investment into our infrastructure, into our public education system, and into a healthcare system. And that's the question we have to ask and have that dialogue. Now, um, President Obama, I was disappointed that he didn't call on the, the 14th Amendment and say, listen, we're going to tell the rest of the world we're going to pay off our debts. And once we've made that message, then let's get to the table and figure out what are the ways that we need to manage what we're dealing with right now in this economy and in this recession. And so I, I think that um, it's hard being in the position of an elected person having done it for nine years. Um, I don't, you know, I know how difficult it is when you're making those tough decisions and all of the different voices that are coming. But at the end of the day, when you're not able to find your way uh, to a compromise or to a solution that's a win-win like what I did with the quarry, then you have to go back to what are your basic principles and how do you put the sand in the line that says no, uh, you know, no way am I, are we going backwards on a woman's right to choose what happens to her body um, or any other number of examples. Mm -hmm. Could you give us just a quick sketch of your foreign policy positions on the war in Iraq the war in Afghanistan, and whether the Congress should have had to authorize our action in Libya. Just briefly, because our time is okay, tight. Okay. <laughs> Congress should, should have been involved in that decision to go into Libya. We should definitely be out of Iraq and out of, out of Afghanistan. I have a brother that's just finished his seventh tour overseas in the Middle East, and we're going to have two million more veterans that are going to be coming home into our communities in various states of health and not a system in place to figure out how we're going to help them integrate back into a non-war environment. Um, we spent over a trillion dollars already and those dollars need to be brought home and spent at home. We have poor people, we have children that are homeless, we have hungry people in our own country and we're not addressing the issues right here and building our own infrastructure. Um, and we need to start taking a look at how we build, rebuild our own infrastructure, how to return America to that place that we had pride in what we were doing as a country and working together to create an America that serves as many people in our country as we can, the majority of the people, hopefully. So there are a number um, of issues related to that in terms of corporate policy and how, you know, how we um, support corporations in, in um, subsidies, uh, corporate entitlements. We're talking about entitlements to the poor. We need to start talking about entitlements to the corporations, um, oil companies and, and others that are reaping the benefits of taxpayer dollars and we're not getting the return. Let's talk a little bit of politics. You, you got a race coming up, mm -hmm. a new sprawling district, right. a new election system. Uh, where do you see your constituency, your natural constitu constituency? Who are they? Where are they? And 
What do you think it costs to, to participate in a race such as this at this time in America? Well, boy, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> you have right. one minute. You got one, one minute, minute and four seconds. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that uh, the in terms of the cost, um, you know, it'll vary and it'll depend on how you run your campaign. I've always been a grassroots candidate and so building the capacity in the communities that I visit, having people that are um, liking the message that I'm bringing, the experience, the connections I have with the different communities and them working with me on those. Um, what was the first constituency? Well, who, the What's constituency. Your base? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think I'm I'm a, I'm attractive to women. I think I'm attractive to Democratic women in particular. Um, I do have perhaps some crossover support because I have been uh, fiscally responsible in my own activities as a county supervisor. I don't take the car allowance or the pension plan. I come in usually under budget um, from the other county supervisors. So that's appealing to maybe the more moderate uh, mm -hmm. groups. But I have really um, progressive um, policies that I've helped to bring across the finish line. The new health and wellness campus that went from 14,000 to 100,000 mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, clients that we serve. Bike and ped pathways to get people out of their cars. Watershed restoration. A criminal justice system that's focusing on a therapeutic approach. And that attracts to criminal justice groups, um, safety groups in my capacity as a disaster council chair, building a medical reserve corps that has nas been nationally recognized. So I think that those um, things that I've worked on over the last nine years are very appealing to people that want to see somebody that's not afraid to fight the fight, roll up their sleeves, and get busy with the work of solving America's problems. Supervisor Susan Adams, candidate for Congress. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Really appreciated the time with you today. Thank you. Richard Rappaport has covered Bay Area politics for the last 30 years. He's been a contributor to The Chronicle, political editor for Focus Magazine, and currently writes for the electronic newspaper Patch. He lives in Mill Valley, and he's going to talk with us about politics. We just had Susan Adams on our show, huh. and uh, she's involved in the open congressional seat. Uh, and there are five Democrats in that seat, and I think a couple of Republicans that you're reporting about. Uh, and before we talk about them, what we wanted to discuss was the redistricting of the, of the uh, district and the top uh, two primary system and how that might affect the race. What are your thoughts on those? Well, right now, I think everybody is sort of holding their breath and uh, waiting for the official maps to come out for the new district. But people pretty much agree it's going to be um, the old District 2 along with um, a whole swath of coastline up to the Oregon border, which just sort of adds, what it does is it adds um, more than just kind of a population. I mean, it's a smaller population up there than down here. That's not, that's interesting. And it's something people are gonna have to run towards, but maybe even more than that, um, it's the geography. Do you have the money to reach this whole huge district? That's the thing, I mean, how do you, you know, how do you figure out a media strategy for a district that's 300, 400 miles by 50 miles. It's, it's a, it, it adds a whole dimension to it. And to my knowledge, none of the candidates is a private pilot, so they'll be driving to Eureka a whole lot. <laughs> or at least <laughs> once or twice before they hire an airplane. Yeah. yeah. But well, going to the top two primary issue, though, what, what does that do to it? Um, well, I think, I think it's a disaster. And I, you know, I just have been running the numbers as much as I can. And I, I have to admit, I was excused from math my junior year in high school. I mean, you know, adding and subtracting are about as far as I got. But um, I think, I think, um, disaster for whom? Tell me why you think that. Well, I think there is a possibility here. There's a scenario that actually, if the Republicans were disciplined enough and the Democrats stupid enough, um, it would be possible to get two Republicans in the final and thereby, you know, in either one would then win. I don't think they're strong enough to do that. Mm -hmm. But if you just look at, you know, five Democrats running, it, it almost means that you can win with 20 percent. And uh, the and registration for Republicans in this newly drawn district is 21 yep. percent. And the decline to state vote is pretty substantial. It's bigger than the Republican uh, contingent. It's hard to know how those will split. Well, that's right. But it sort of adds some tang to the race. And, um, you know, it's just, it's hard to figure because it's the, uh, first time um, this district's been open in 20 years, and so it's kind of all new. It's a new ball game. I think the uh, Tea Party brings a whole other element to it. So 
it is highly unlikely that the Democrats are going to give up, lose this seat because this is the most liberal seat probably, you know, except for Barbara Lee's in, in the East Bay. It, you know, it just isn't topped by anything else. But it's the system they, they have now. I don't know who did it. I, I'm going to go back and take a look because it must be the same people who did the tiered voting in San Francisco, which was such a disaster. I mean, well, the, the redistricting commission was created by uh, a series of initiatives that were drawn by common cause. Yeah, yeah. And I generally support it. I'm waiting to see uh, what the true outcome is. But the idea of having politicians select their voters has always offended me. That's called gerrymandering. Well, and, and, and in the case of the Bay Area, it was called filmandering because <laughs> Phil Burton was a master at it. And yeah. Willie, Willie mandering as well because Willie was not as good as Phil, but... Phil was world class as far as that went. I don't know. I think we're, you know, I, I think we discard our politicians at our own peril. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I, I'm, I'm offended by the idea that uh, we need term limits, well, that, that the voters aren't big enough and adult enough to be able to police their own. No, I agree with you there. Yeah. But we have three wild card factors. We have a newly drawn district and most of these candidates are unknown to the people in the northern part of it. Yeah. We have a top two system which has not really been sorted through and, and voters are not sure how that is going to play out. And then we have an open seat. And so there's no incumbent and that makes it this scramble. And as we know, if anything can go wrong, it will. And so this is going to be a messy election, I have a feeling. It's going to hinge on uh, factors that are out of a lot of people's control. and so. You know, unfortunately, in a situation like this, it all comes back to money. And will there be heavy in independent expenditures? Because the Supreme Court, in the Citizens United case, unleashed unlimited corporate money. Now, we don't have candidates who appear to be real, uh, you know, potential beneficiaries of a big corporate campaign, but they will choose the, the person they find least offensive to try to prevent a real progressive or a, a, an extreme liberal from being elected. Yeah, that's kind of Bill Bagley's, the famous Marin politician Bill Bagley's take on it. Um, but I think somebody like um, Daniel Roberts, Dan Roberts, who is a, uh, a stockbroker from Tiburon, which of course <laughs> is always a good thing to be, um, is running and he's pledged to put in uh, about half a million dollars of his own money uh, for the first round and then an equal amount for the next round. So I think, you know, that may, it could buy a lot of time on um, the KOZT, the coast, which is the uh, radio station up in Fort Bragg that may be the best rock and roll station <laughs> in the world. Well, I, I think it would be very naive to think that uh, this uh, campaign expenditures for a serious candidate in this race wouldn't be anywhere less than a million dollars yeah. between now and the end of the day. Sure. And the question is, where are these guys going to get it and who's going to give it to them? And it is scary uh, to me that uh, large interest groups could come in, back really the, the non-progressive Democrat or a Republican, and you really lose the character of the seat because the progressives are just bought out by large interests. Yeah. Well, you know, another, another thing that um, is interesting about the race is that it's kind of there is a new generation that's running now. These are, these are I call them kids, but I mean you know, people in their mid to late 30s, 40s. And, and they're a, a different kind of animal, and they've been brought up in a different sort of political realm than we have in a lot of ways. And I'm not sure we can, we can uh, guarantee how they're going to jump. Well, Susan Adams, for example, not, you know, I mean, on a certain level, she's that way. Um, uh, Tiffany Renee um, is... I think 40, something like that. So She's on the Petaluma City Council. Uh, I, I don't know too much about her, and here in Marin, we haven't heard a lot about her so far. Yeah, yeah. There are, um, again, the, the uh, um, Bill Bagley, who knows more about politics in Marin than anybody else, um, seems to think that you, you lose more votes than you gain by sort of saying where you come from. You know, a, uh, a supervisor from... Marin County, for example, and run sort of like he always did as a, uh, a country lawyer or something suitably folksy. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So what do you think will be some of the defining factors here? Uh, and assuming, let, let's talk primarily about the Democratic uh, contenders. Mm. Uh, will there be some predictable splits where the female candidates will split the presumptive female vote? that the more liberal candidates like Norman Solomon and Susan Adams, to some extent, 
uh, may end up splintering their vote. Yeah, well, that's an interesting point. I mean, I think that um, when you when you have um, four or five women in the race, you want to look at Emily's list, for example, which is a uh, well, Emily stands for early money um, is like yeast, and it's kind of been a, a, a women's activist group that funds candidates. Now, are they going to be able to pick a, you know, out of the two or three women who are running? How do you do that? You know, it's sort of an interesting holdover from uh, um, what happened, you know, who, held this, who has held this seat for the last 35, 40 years, beginning with Barbara Boxer. Now, as we're speaking at the end of August, a woman named Stacy Fowler has just jumped into the race. She's never held office. She describes herself as a successful businesswoman, an entrepreneur who's created jobs. Uh, she seems to at least claim that she can raise some money. Uh, will a neophyte like that be able to go up against Huffman and Adams, who at, at least have uh, a substantial history in office? Well, she's pretty interesting. I mean, she's done um, a lot of NGO work around the world and has set up boys' towns and girls' towns in India. And as uh, you know, I actually interviewed her a couple days ago and asked her about um, you know what she thought would you know allow her to run or allow her to win. And I think she you know sees it as sort of the next step in this career of public service that she's done. So, is yeah. it Larson or Fowler? Uh, it's Larson. Yeah. Oh, so Lawson, it, it, Stacey Lawson. Lawson. Yeah, I think she has apologies. to spend some money for name recognition. My, my apologies, yeah. Stacey. <laughs> of course, on the other hand, she doesn't have anything bad said about her because nobody's, you know, heard <laughs> yet. <laughs> so that, that is interesting because I wonder what is, wh when I just heard about her the other day, and uh, what are her bona fides for running for Congress? I mean, is it vanity or is it really a mission on her part? Oh, I didn't, uh, you know, when I interviewed her, I didn't see vanity particularly. Um, uh, is it anybody can run? This is the United States of America, and yeah. there are some people running for the Republican uh, nomination for president who uh, I would not don't stack up to her as far as IQ remotely. So uh -huh. I, being being dumb is not a, a drawback. These, well, I'm not suggesting days. she's dumb. Yeah. Anyway, well, no, no, I I think that uh, she's somebody who you know whether she figures in the final or not is going to get some votes and has some. Uh, a good a good biography, a good story to tell. Richard Rappaport, I wish we could talk longer. Thanks for joining us today. Okay, thanks Peter.